I'm not really a China specialist or a China expert. My interest in China developed out of an interest in the global economy as a whole. I think if you want to understand how the global economy operates, you have to understand China's place in that larger global economy. China is the most important part of globalization today, in the 21st century, but China also played the most, most important role in the first period of globalization, back in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, when Europeans and Chinese first connected in a truly global world of trade. Uh, I had never heard the word Tiansha before uh, December 2015 and it's a, a very funny little story. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a visiting professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, I was doing all of my research in the library there and uh, the library was called the Wang Gungwu Library and I thought that Wang Gungwu was just some rich man who gave money for the <laughs> library. But then I was at an event, and the speaker at the event was Professor Wang Gungwu. And I said, wow, you're, you're a real person. And it turns out he is a very eminent historian. Mm -hmm. And he had written an entire book about Tiansha. And Tiansha as a contemporary concept in China's foreign relations today. And I said, I'm very interested in the role of the United States in shaping the, the, the postmodern world, in shaping how the world is governed and how it connects. And Professor Wang said, well, maybe what you mean is a tiansha. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's perfect. And so I've been using the word uh, to describe the American system uh, ever since in a series of articles. And now in the book, American Tiansha. In its classical meaning, Tiansha is not just the world, the way we in English would talk about the world as a physical place. It doesn't just mean uh, a geography. Uh, it also means a moral order. So in Western history, we might talk of medieval Europe using the word Christendom, the entire Christian world. That is a world that was a geographical world, but also that had a unified understanding of how things work, a unified understanding of the difference between the secular and the divine, a unified understanding of uh, a moral code of how the world should work. I think that today's American Tiansha also has those qualities. It's not just an American world in the sense of American power or the United States forcing it people and countries to do things. The American tin shot to me is a way of thinking. Uh, it's the fact that we think of ourselves as individuals and we think that individualism is the right way to run the world. That individuals have human rights, you know, that individuals have aspirations. The light motif for it has become the, the ideology of the world today. Uh, thus I think the world today is not just a geographical world with American power versus Chinese power versus Russian power. It's a unified system, a unified way that we all live, in that wherever you go in the world, people think that individual rights are important, and they especially think their own individual rights are important. That's very different from the classical Chinese Tianxia, mm -hmm. based on yeah. Confucianism. Mm -hmm. But it's also like the old Chinese Tianxia, an entire world unified by a single way of thinking about the world. And that's why I've used the term. Is that very few people today are truly Confucian. Uh, they may like Confucius, they may like to read Confucius, they may think he's a very profound thinker and scholar, but most people don't want to obey their parents. <laughs> most people don't think that we should live our lives according to the responsibilities we have to our country, uh, to our families. You know, most people today think that they should live their own lives. 
And that's very anti-Confucian. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea that you should do what you want with your life is very foreign to Confucianism. Mm -hmm. So while the old classical Chinese Tian Sha, the Tian Sha of the Ming and Qing dynasties, was very much a Confucian uh, Tian Sha, a Confucian world, today's world simply is not Confucian. That's where individual comes, and that's what makes it very American. You know, in the United States Declaration of Independence, uh, they wrote that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Mm -hmm. Life, liberty, and the big one, pursuit of happiness. <laughs> you know, already 230 years ago, Americans were talking about the pursuit of individual happiness being the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Not family, not country. Uh, it's very different, for example, from France. In France, they had liberté, égalité, fraternité, which means the top priority is that you have a group fraternal existence. Uh, the American idea is nothing about the group, it's all about the individual. In China today, uh, I think that China has changed dramatically uh, from a country that put group solidarity first, uh, whether that was in ancient China, the family, or in communist China, the work unit or the country into a, a country that puts individual accomplishment first. Uh, now, whether that's good or bad is not for me to say, uh, but I think it has happened, and that is undeniable that the change has occurred, even in China, uh, not just in the United States or Australia. Mm -hmm. I think the, the problem facing China is that it is not just a country in a world of countries. If we went back 100 years into the modern era, uh, you know, the most powerful countries in the world imposed their will on other countries. Today we live in a world of individuals. Uh, there, you know, no longer do countries tell people what to do. People do what they want. And if countries don't like it, people leave, or people change the government. Uh, but it's the individual that comes first. So I think no matter how powerful China becomes, it won't change the fact that individual Chinese people are putting themselves first, in the same way that individual Americans do. You know, so I think we live in a world where it's not possible for any country to impose its will on other countries. Instead, it's a way of thinking that is changing the minds of people everywhere. And that way of thinking is very American. And that's why in the book and in my lectures, I don't say it's very United States. It's not the United States that is ruling over the world. It's American ways of thinking that are coming to rule over the world. No, I don't think so. And, and the reason is that the BRICs are countries, not ideologies. Uh, and again, I really want to distinguish between American as a way of living and the United States as a particular country. Uh, as the BRICs develop, you know, the BRICs, BRICs are Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. As the BRICs develop, leading citizens of BRIC countries want to go study at Harvard and Yale. Uh, they want their children to attend U.S. universities. Uh, they want to keep their money in American dollars. Uh, they want to get American passports. Uh, you know, they, they want to join the larger world, not be Russian nationalists, Brazilian nationalists, mm -hmm. you know, Indian nationalists, Chinese nationalists, South African nationalists. And as they join the larger world, they join this fundamentally American world. So I don't see them as challengers. I mean, if we were to ask, who will the leading people of the 21st century be? Maybe they'll all be from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But they will be leading people. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil will not be the leading country. Uh, Russia will not be the leading country. You know, even India and China 
as large as they are, will not be the leading country. And I conclude that as those people are the leading, are working as a leading position in a particular industry, however, they all possess an American way of thinking. I think That's they, why it's the American team chat. Absolutely. I think they very much think of themselves as individuals pursuing their own agendas and their own happiness. Who is leading the way towards the 21st century? It's not old industrial companies. It's companies like, you know, you can go down the list, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Uber, uh, you know, I mean, and when you go down the list of, the, of these companies, they're overwhelmingly based in North America. They're all companies that think of the world in a very individualistic, entrepreneurial, classically American way. And so the people who succeed in those companies are people who embrace that. In traditional societies, you tell children what they have for dinner. They're <laughs> children. Uh, it's a very American idea that you ask what you want for dinner, what you want to be when you grow up, what university do you want to attend, what do you want to study. Uh, and people who come to think that way, whether they know it or not, are thinking in a very American, a very characteristically American, not Western. It's not a German way of thinking or a French way of thinking. It's a very American way of thinking. It's American society that's very infectious, that, that gets inside the mind and changes the way you think. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Trump is an interesting figure because although Trump uh, ran on a platform of tradition and old-fashioned values and resurgence of manufacturing, Trump himself is the ultimate individualist. <laughs> okay? Trump is the ultimate American in the sense of somebody who just wants to do whatever he wants in America. Uh, and so even though he angers a lot of people, I don't think... So he might prevent people from wanting to uh, live in America, but he doesn't prevent them from wanting to think like Americans. And really, that's, for me, the whole message. Uh, it's the way people think.